All right, we're gonna get this kicked off. Well, uh, hello everybody, and uh, my name's Kirk Cabana, and, and welcome to week five of Pursuit for Purpose. You know, many of us on this call are very new or have no idea what Pursuit for Purpose is, so I encourage you to head over to the website, pursuitforpurpose.com, that's the number four in Pursuit for Purpose, uh, to see what our mission is in the previous recorded sessions. Before getting into a brief explanation of what Pursuit for Purpose is, though, I'd really like to just tell all of you guys thank you. I really appreciate you taking some time for yourself and being willing to share in some information that might be able to assist you in the different areas of your journey. Pursuit for Purpose brings the world's most passionate athletes together in a collaborative environment to encourage our goals and aspirations. By using the teachings and principles of the greatest minds before us, we will give our athletes the foundations to build the rest of their lives and become champions of character. Although there will be a great deal of information and experiences shared throughout this call, the most fundamental thing that must come from it in order for there to be any change is action. Words will not do a thing. What actions you take from the information you receive will be the only chance for anything to come from it now. I encourage you to take step one and some of those processes that only you know you're lacking currently. The topic for this week is hope. Previously to date, we've discussed character, discipline, accountability, and faith. Hope is something that has to be alive in our hearts for the goals and dreams that we wish to achieve. John C. Maxwell says, if there's hope in the future, there's power in the present. The reason why this topic is so important is that many of us are always working towards unlocking our next level of potential within our sport. And I believe to get there, we have to see and believe that that person is within us already as we train in all areas relentlessly to get it out, but it will not come out on accident. Hope is defined as the feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out best. This goes hand in hand with athletics. We compete and train with hope that what we are working towards will lead us to where we will continue to find ourselves. Sports is our vehicle to build that foundation of our lives that will ultimately help us become who we believe we are, whatever the goal may be. This week, we have two guests with us that I believe ex have experienced a tremendous amount of hope, both respectively from different walks of life, which adds even more to the perspective that they can share and the values that can be learned through, through the sport and translated into the rest of our lives. Brian Eisenberg is a business mastermind and a, pro and a prolific author, having numerous New York Times bestselling books, having started numerous companies and assisting many other companies in growth with result-based suggestions. He brings to the table expertise in the fields that he chooses to dive into. He's also no stranger to the game of baseball, with co-authoring Committed, the guide to developing college-ready recruits from middle school to high school, which I re recommend to all young athletes in here, and having helped a baseball tech startup as well, as well as most recently going through the daunting process of recruiting with his son, who has recently committed to a top NJCAA nationally recognized program. He's a great mind as a person overall to get to share any time with. Walter Bede is a mind in baseball that many of us know, a former draft pick, himself with professional playing experience, a former NCAA head coach, co-founder of Mentors of Baseball, along with being through the MLB draft process three times, once for himself and twice with his son. Walter Bede brings experience to this game. He has helped over 300 kids in the last 25 years with obtaining their dream to play college baseball, and even some onto professional baseball. Now he has put pen to paper as the co-author with Brian Eisenberg to, in their new book, giving us all the chance to learn from the information that they have gathered over this time, so you can use it to benefit your life in the process of obtaining your dreams. Both of these men have exhibited tremendous amounts of hope through their journey to getting where they're at now. And I think it's safe to say that there's much more in store. So please join me with an emoji clap with welcoming both Brian and Walter to the stage. Guys, appreciate you being on. Very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, definitely a pleasure to be here tonight. So uh, I, I want to get going with uh, just a couple of questions for both of our guests today and be able to go ahead and uh, 
just kind of give some perspective on where they're coming from in their journey and let you guys in on the table. A lot of the times they're on the other side uh, doing the interviews to the other to some great people in this game right now. So I want to be able to just give us a little chance to get to know them a little bit better as well, too. So uh, whichever you guys wants to go ahead and shoot first, you know, that's completely up to you. But I, I want to know what does hope mean to you personally? Go ahead, Walter. You can take it first. Well, hope for me is um, kind of achieving as a father, um, you know, goals um, and futures uh, for my sons and their families. Uh, hope for me is maintaining health on a daily basis. Those close to me, um, my wife, uh, our family. Uh, hope for me is being able to help and alter and hopefully influence younger student athletes uh, and their families in the pursuit of their, their dreams and their goals. That was the singular purpose of Brian and I writing the book. It's also the purpose and the mission statement that Butch, Brian, and myself strive for when we speak via Twitter spaces, whether it be on Sunday or Monday evenings, whether it be answering direct messages from families on a daily basis, we strive to provide hope and understanding, not only for the process as it pertains to baseball, but most importantly to being able to add clarity to their lives and a peace of mind to know that they can reach out to us in hopes of gaining answers and perception of what, you know, their futures may uh, entail. And so for myself personally, that's, that's my approach each and every day. That's powerful, powerful for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that just kind of on a side note, you know, uh, the, the way Walter and I got together is, you know, uh, we, I, I assume we both uh, hoped that uh, Clubhouse would take off and we make some great connections there. And uh, Walter and I, you know, just started chatting. And uh, next thing we know, we've written a book together. And, um, you know, I, I think our mutual hope is that we can impact as many people as we can positively every single day. I mean, that's, you know, that's been my mission since I started uh uh, in school as a social worker to becoming an entrepreneur to being an author uh, and then obviously now working uh, with Walter. That's awesome. Again, thank you guys a, a ton for being on and getting an opportunity to share both of your perspectives because it's just, it's invaluable to everybody that could be ha having an opportunity to just learn from people that have been through the processes themselves. We're all looking for different opportunities at all times to try to, to better ourselves. And I understand that's probably why most of us are in here, you know, development, especially self-development is not necessarily something that you can force on to anybody. You have to be ready to walk through that door yourself. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't walk through that door until we face different challenges that made it have to be one that we knocked on to open to. So I want to get into the next one and, uh, and uh, get a little bit more real uh, in, in the journey, because as, as much as we like to talk about the good stuff, sometimes we can share and learn from the challenges that we put ourselves through. So I wanted to know if you guys can identify in a time in your life that you felt hope was lost or, or really challenged for you. You know, how, how did you overcome that? Did hope return at some point? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, you know, I've, uh, my brother and I have been business partners for the last, wow, over 26 years now. And uh, so more, more than half my life. And uh, we've, we've been in numerous ventures and we've been with, you know, different partners. And uh, uh, twice now, we've been in situations where, uh, actually, no, even three times. We were left in situations where we hoped that the people we uh, were doing business with were um, uh, on the same mission as us, driven for the same purpose as us, 
uh, looking to make the same kind of impact with us. Um, uh, the first one, one day we came into the office and all of a sudden the front doors were locked and uh, all the people that um, had helped us with the business and you know helped us even with cash and stuff like that were, were just completely lost because our partner was a thief and we didn't know it. And uh, we didn't know what to do. And um, we had just come back from uh, a personal bankruptcy and we had to just kind of figure out what we were going to do next. And my brother and I made it our mission that we were going to make sure that every single person who you know contributed any money into the company, we were going to find a way somehow to, to make sure they were made whole. Uh, and we were eventually able to do that. Um, you know, and, and it's happened a couple of different ways with a couple of different people. And I think one of the, the, the key things for me and, and key finding hope is that, you know, yes, there are people out there who are aligned in mission and values uh, and they care about the same things you do. And when you connect with people, you know, like Walter, who who's proven himself, you know, like we said, over the last 25 years, you heard in his bio earlier, uh, of the type of person that he is, uh, that, then you kind of know that you're you're in the right space. No, no pun intended on that one, by the way. Great stuff. A lot of personal adversity, it sounds like, as far as, you know, to getting to where you're at. And and I know that with your own experiences of the success that you've been able to find, even fighting through those different adversities, it, it just kind of is almost uh, without welcoming it. I'm sure that, you know, all right, what's the game plan to get out of this situation and work f towards something better that you know that you can continue to achieve? Because it's it's kind of being able to know just as much as as you've fought and through how much more you know you can become because of the different experiences that you've been able to take on for yourself so i think it's powerful that you've got that in your back pocket as as a person as you continue moving forward in your journey and, and, and more than that you know i think the, the biggest lesson I, I i've taken away from all this is that you know it's just energy it's just an energy so you know if you feel hopeless, if you feel lost, if you feel like you failed at something, it's just an energy. You can you can pass by it. You can change that energy. You can swap it with something else. And so when you start focusing in on going towards those positive energies, good things keep happening. And I think that's, you know, it, it, it's hard when we're young, obviously, because, you know, we, we haven't experienced it enough. Uh, but hopefully for those who are, who are young in here, when you realize, uh, you know, those failures, that's just it. it's just energy and energy but just like a light switch you can turn on you can turn off it's positive it's negative no problem what's next right what are you going to do next to it um you know and, and, I, and i hope that's one of the lessons i definitely passed on to to my kids and you know including uh my son sammy who's in you know in the room and, and, and the baseball player and hopefully we, we can uh, uh get him a little bit on the call as well because you know he's also faced some of that adversity and how he's overcome it right? well, using a lot of the same principles that that's awesome that you say that because one of my favorite things that I've just been been put on to from a, a coach of mine is, you know, the worst thing that can happen is a feeling. So ultimately, just like you said, it's being able to turn the page, move on, analyze that feeling and turn the page and, and get to the next one that you can not to say rid yourself of it, but work through it and work towards finding yourself in a better situation. Uh, Walter, sorry to make it uh, long before you got your chance to speak, but if you want to go ahead and, and uh, take it on, or if you need me to repeat the question, feel free to let me know. I enjoy listening, so I don't worry about me. But um, I, I kind of have a rather unique perspective to this whole, um, I guess, process. Uh, I lost my parents when I was six and 16. Um, I lived on my own. I had my own apartment. I had to deal with the Department of Youth and Family Services. Uh, I was a junior in high school when I lost my dad. Uh, I was a class officer um, and made a deal that as long as I maintained, you know, my grades, um, and I checked in every two weeks that uh, I could essentially live off of working in a supermarket every weekend, Damula supermarket, uh, where I made $107.21 every weekend. And I had a $363.54 Social Security check. And as luck would have it, I found myself drafted. I had a scholarship to attend Arizona State with Coach Brock, 
which at the time the Pac-10, as it was referred to then, was probably the equivalent of the SEC as we know it today. Um, had a gentleman by the name of Lenny Marillo, who was a scout, uh, Major League Scouting Bureau scout, but a former Chicago Cub. And I found myself in a decision as a senior in high school to sign a contract for $50,000, which at the time the first round draft pick for the Chicago Cubs was Joe Carter out of Wichita State and a young man by the name of Vance Lovelace from Hillsborough High School. And they both got approximately $200,000. And so I looked at myself and looked at the thought of having a $50,000 check. I didn't know what taxes meant. Um, so I, I signed to play and become a professional baseball player. And I remember having to make the phone call to Coach Brock. And to this day, I can hear him on the other end of the phone literally yelling, no, 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 no. And when I hung up, I didn't know that that sound on that voice that I heard on the other end of the phone would resonate 30 years later when I had a son who had accepted a scholarship to Vanderbilt University and was a first-round draft pick. And everyone from his advisor to his mom to his grandparents to his buddies, everybody in the room... Uh, when it came time to be the deadline, which was August 15th of 2011, I would say there were probably 40 people saying you should sign. And there was one person that said you shouldn't sign. So where does hope come in? It took 30 years to figure out that a college life not just academically, socially, um, athletically, um, all of the interactions and friendships and relationships, that baseball was not anything more than a business and that you get one decade to be a young man from the ages of 11 to 21, one decade. We can be adults for several decades. And when my, when my son made the decision to pass on the opportunity to sign and had to go through the, the weight and expectation over three years. Now, when people look at it now in hindsight, oh, it all worked out. When you are a parent watching your child be scorched, ridiculed, humiliated, embarrassed for three years via social media, media, publications, etc. And then you see that your son obtains a college degree, becomes a big leaguer, and his dreams come true. That's hope. That's life. That is all-encompassing as a parent. And when I talk to parents to this day, I tell them, your son will have one decade, surround him with mentors, with pillars of the type of people that you would like your son to become. And if you do that each and every day, when he or she is 22 or 23, they'll be able to look back and know that you successfully passed the baton of not only hope, but opportunity. That is simply probably the greatest joy uh, that I ever experienced as a parent. That was powerful, Walter. That's that's an incredible journey, and to get to hear it firsthand from you is uh, is something that just uh, hit, hit me deep right now just because, you know, I've got my own little guy, and uh, I'm not even thinking about any kind of professional aspirations, but just everything of what you're talking about, of hopefully giving him the opportunities to just get to be a young man, get to grow up, get to build some values, get to enjoy some youthfulness and put that work in to achieve whatever goals that he's after. And, and to hear you speak a, as a parent, first and foremost, uh, it's, it's really, really powerful. And I hope that some of you guys on, 
on this call can understand for yourselves that the lessons that you're learning at this time, just like Walter had said, you might not learn them truly until you reach a little bit more age to see the different experiences of what's going to come through your life and through your experience. So I really appreciate you sharing that candid information with us to just to, to, to share your heart, because I can't imagine what those couple of years were like to to have to read about a decision that you felt was the right decision and have it publicly scrutinized continuously. And now everybody wants to revisit history as a you know, re revisionist and, and see it as the right thing that was always supposed to happen. But there was plenty of questions along the way. So I am, uh, you know, pr proud, proud of your family for working through what you guys did. And, you know, funny enough, I was playing some MLB the show yesterday and uh, your son had retired at the nice ripe age of 37. So uh, if uh, if video games have any uh, theories, he's going to have a nice long career. Well, I certainly hope so. I, I, you know, I just had a conversation with him uh, yesterday. He's actually attending Logan Webb's wedding this evening. But, you know, the prognosticators and all of the, the wonderful opinionated people within the world of written media and social media want to erect a gravestone. And when they say things like, have not lived up to expectations, Whose expectations? And that's what I, uh, you know, our conversation centered around. And other people's expectations have no weight, no bearing, no meaning. It's his expectations. And that's really um, the difference. And so if he is able to pitch for one more year or 10 more years, that's up to the big guy. Right, exactly. And and the most powerful thing of even searching after all of those aspirations and and those goals is who he's gotten to become in the process of obtaining those and who he'll still get to continue to become as he pushes himself towards what his best abilities are and wherever the big guy decides to lead him, like you said, is going to be right where he was supposed to be, whether or not that's on, on the field in a long, long career, or whether or not that's in some different area that he's going to make an impact in life. Because I don't think that you put pour that into yourself and then all of a sudden turn it off. You know, my, I, I was probably never going to get there as five, nine hundred and thirty pounds soaking wet kid for myself. But ultimately, you know, you still have the dreams, you still have the aspirations. But the biggest aspiration, more than playing the sport, was always what's the back door into life that this sport gets me to, you know, find myself in that I can help bring people up through because what's, what's success if you don't bring others with you. And that's what I see sports as is just this vehicle of positive change that we get to pour ourselves into and discipline our lives and find the values and translate those things that we're pouring ourselves into within our sport back into the other areas that are more important. And I think if we miss those things, we're kind of missing the point as to why we're going through these challenges intentionally. And, and that's where, for me, as a personal perspective of why hope has been so important to me was at a certain point in my life, I was only identified through my sports. And when my sport fell, inevitably, I was left with nothing to stand on as a human being. And so I ran and I hid in plain sight. And, and it was not fun having to do that. But the values and the different things that I began learning and understanding that much more about my sport are what made me make some significant changes that hey, I'll probably bring up at, a, at another point in this call. But uh, believe me, guys, you don't want to go back and play junior college baseball as a 30 year old, because I don't think that you're probably going to have the wife that allows you to do that. So I want to get into the, uh, the last question that I got for you guys before maybe some of you guys have some question that you want to ask or start getting into sharing some stuff for yourselves. But the last question I got is what can your hope for your own future and living in your truth bring to others? So let me, let me, let me take this one into the past and then, I'll, and then, and then we'll bring it into the future. So um, when we first started um, in the online marketing world, my brother and I, we started our agency 
um, you know, we had written a couple tiny little self-published books. Um, and then we, we decided we were going to write a more of a bigger manifesto, something that was really substantial. And we had always assumed, and you know what happens when you assume, that, you know, everybody should be concerned with the conversion rates on their websites, right? Like, you know, it's, it's great to have eyeballs. It's great to have traffic. But truthfully, if you don't have sales, then you, you're in trouble. So one of the things that we, we hoped we could do is get people to share about the book, and hopefully that would help increase the, the sales of the book. And so we went ahead and we, we mailed a bunch of copies out, and, and, and um, one of the copies we sent out was to Seth Godin. And uh, Seth and I have become, you know, friends, and you know, we, we, we've had a, a couple of wonderful meals together, and talked about our passion of dark chocolate together. But um, I hadn't met Seth at that point, and from, from just one day out of nowhere, he puts up a, a blog post that says, "Don't judge a book by its cover." And uh, basically said, if you don't have a website, don't wait even one minute before checking out Call to Action, How to Improve Your Conversion Rate. The author sent me a copy a few weeks ago, but I was too busy writing my ebook to read this. A shame, because I could have stolen countless ideas from them. It's filled with all the facts and details. And it goes on. It says, but here it goes. Despite the god-awful cover, this book is an astonishing bargain. The book is straightforward and gives you direct, clear insight to what's wrong with your site, and on and on. That one share that we touched this one person that he thought it was so valuable ended up putting us on the New York times bestseller list. And that changed, uh, obviously the course of, uh, our agency of our consulting of our speaking. And so, you know, I look at this now and, you know, I, I, I got together with Walter because I realized that the, the kind of passion that he brought to impacting kids lives and the knowledge and wisdom and all the experience, and I was like, okay, you know, we, we can we can get this into a book. We can pack it in there. And so we sat together, and and, and you know, we still still haven't met in person. I did meet Butch this weekend. Um, we sat together on the phone, you know, a few times a week, and and we sat and just wrote out that book as fast as we could, and we, and we got it out to market. And our hope is, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of money thrown down the drain. There's a lot of angst and, and pain that parents go through, um, you know, trying to, to see, you know, their children, you know, uh, enjoy the sport, but they miss being present for, for now when they really should be enjoying the moments of the relationship, the time they're spending, all on the hope that one day, maybe, you know, they'll, they'll play in college or, or, or they'll, they'll be a big leaguer, big, uh, big leaguer, even, even in, in in uh, elite six U teams, I, I know Walter will, will definitely talk uh, about some of that hope. And it's great to dream, right? We should all have those dreams. There's nothing wrong with those dreams. But we're hoping we can give parents an anchor uh, to for that hope, so that they have a, a roadmap, a way to, to 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 move forward based on all this wisdom and and, and Walter, um, you know, had brought into the book. Um, and who knows, maybe, maybe the Seth Godin of, of baseball will go out and tell everybody, go, go and grab a copy, even though it, whatever, just didn't have paid the pages <laughs> numbers in, in the first printing. So who knows? Well, for me personally, just, um, trying to stay within the context of the sport of baseball, these types of events, uh, I, I, as well as Butch and, and obviously Brian, we truly want to, when, when we use the term give back, you know, that can be interpreted in several different ways. And when we have the opportunity to speak with parents, we offer nothing more than life experience and our uh, opinions, thoughts um, within the spectrum of the world of baseball. Meaning, it's my feeling that baseball has become a business at the youth level to the point where parents feel they're being left behind. Uh, they feel that they're inundated with information that it's hard for them to break down and decipher. And so with regard to the book and with regard to mentors of baseball, mentors of baseball is not just three gentlemen 
from different parts of the country with different backgrounds within the sport of baseball. Mentors of Baseball is to offer access to parents and student athletes to get real answers to their questions, meaning we don't live in their shoes. We don't walk in their shoes, um, but we do have experiences within all facets of the sport. And so therefore we want to share our thoughts and opinions, and we want to be able to offer them in such a way where we're accessible. We're listening. We're listening. We don't want to tell people what we're doing, what to do. We want to listen to their concerns and we want to offer insight to the process and answers as we may know them. And if we don't know them between Butch, Brian, and myself, we have enough resources to find the answers. And I think really the number one dynamic to the youth baseball platform as it currently exists is to put a quarter in, in my pocket and I'll pop out an answer. And for each answer I give you, you need to put another quarter in my pocket. Whereas as a mentor, that means from today through your college and potentially your professional career, I, I can speak from my perspective. I know Butch has worked with many major leaguers, now major leaguers or soon to be major leaguers. And I'm sure Butch has the same dialogue that he has with a 29 year old adult as he did as a 16 year old student athlete. So my point is, is, Giving back is simply a passing of the baton of knowledge and information and resources and allowing parents and student athletes to have access. And access means all facets of the sport to get real insightful evaluations, opinions as to the direction that a student athlete can or should or might be able to take. And that's why I participate in these types of forums and platforms. And before Butch and I ever said one word to each other, I knew a great deal about Butch. I watched Butch work as it pertained to my son. I watched Butch communicate with other student athletes in a positive manner, in an insightful manner. I watched his enthusiasm. So for me, as a father, that's a gentleman that I would want to put into my son's life because he has something to offer. And with regard to Brian, it's a dynamic as being a, a father who's seeking answers, who's seeking insight, and asks questions and listens to the answers, meaning he doesn't react to the answers. He's listening and being proactive as opposed to reactive. So anybody that finds their way to these types of spaces at the end of the day, is simply passing a baton forward, hoping that it makes your life, your son's life, your daughter's life with regard to sports or specifically baseball, a more enjoyable um, and pleasurable journey. Don't worry about the destination enjoy every second of the journey great stuff walter <laughs> positive great stuff for these these all these listeners and anybody else that might get an opportunity to listen at another time and i know what you guys are talking about the book a little bit and i wanted to give you some more opportunity to to further elaborate on what you guys have gotten to to put together with the combination of your knowledge and the knowledge of the other people that you've been able to bring into this book and uh, and especially with where it pertains in today's landscape on why it can be that much more important to today's youth. Well, I think, unfortunately, youth sports, for some, not all, have become a matter of status, um, both internally and externally, externally, social media, um, we're not deriving enjoyment to the day-to-day -day, uh, successes and failures within the sport. Um, as it pertains to baseball, it used to be a sport that was very pastoral, 
as a young student athlete, meaning pickup games, sandlot games, wiffle ball games. And I don't wax poetically about being in the 70s or the 60s or the 70s. That's not my point. My point is it used to be you'd ride a bike, you'd have a glove and a bat on your handlebars, you'd pick up any round object that remotely resembled a baseball. And if you had a disagreement, there was the great and powerful do-over. And in today's world now, everything's organized. We need umpires, we need uniforms, we need to have adults, and we need adult supervision. And it's taken away from the pure love or passion of the sport. And... And I think if we use sports as nothing more to become ranked uh, with regard to status, um, committing to a school for the pure um, ability to say, I, you know, I'm doing this as a 14 or 15 year older. I don't know what I want for dinner on Friday, but I do know I want to go to school a thousand miles away from my house. I, we're, we've taken away the foundation of the youth sports, which is love passion and enjoyment and all of that entail that it entails i stunk as a baseball player when i say stunk i mean stunk i didn't play organized baseball till i was 10 not because i didn't want to it's because i didn't make a team i didn't make an all-star team till i was 15 but yet somehow i was drafted you know in the 13th round and in a major league baseball draft my point is is i had highs i had lows i stunk and today we don't let student athletes fail they need to go do a lesson if they go 0 for 4. If they give up four hits or a home run with the bases loaded, I need a pitching lesson. If I walk a guy with the bases loaded and an adult's going to show me something and it's going to fix it right away. That's not how the world works. It's certainly not how baseball works. And at the end of the day, in life and in sport, failure creates learning opportunities. And if you're opening your eyes and your ears in your mind to the learning process of failure, things certainly will go a heck of a lot smoother the next time you find your way in that space. That, that's awesome that you, uh, you discussed failure in that respect as well, too, because one of my favorite Zig Ziglar quotes is that failure is an event, not a person. And ultimately, too many times these days, our youth seem to be putting too much weight on on failure itself and not understanding that it's an opportunity for yourself to actually get better. And as we push forward for ourselves, when you start to kind of not seek failure, but embrace the aspect of what failure can mean to you in a positive light, that's where I think that our mental perspective can become that much more dangerous and kind of then reminds me of a, of a, Jim Rohn quote as well, too, of where happiness is not contained in what you get. Happiness is contained in what you become. And that that much more of just the respect of enjoying the process, loving the process of getting to be a person that gets to grow through something. And we've chosen to love the sport of baseball. And at some point, it seems like there's been a disconnect where these kids in the youth level, because of the status that you're talking about, are comparing themselves in uncomparable ways to what the sport of baseball says is supposed to be successful. They want an instant gratification of being 10 for 10 when they don't understand just the peaks and valleys of what you go through in the sport. So I really do hope that there is a, an opportunity for, for parents and the kids alike to, to have the parents re-educate the kids through the process and have them understand that much more of what that whole process of recruiting goes through in that, Hey, you might not be great right now, but that doesn't mean that you can't be great if you keep working. And then also hopefully the parents can be honest with themselves as well as their kids about where they're at in their own process. But um, Brian, did you have anything that you wanted to share as well before I got into uh, seeing if anybody else wanted to contribute and, and add some value to the conversation? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think a, a great illustration of this one, you know, is, is my son, Sammy, right? He, he went out and all through middle school, all he wanted to do was, uh, you know, train and, and be ready to, to make his high school team. You know, here he was, this big kid. He always played you know, reasonably well. Wasn't, you know, obviously the most athletic kid out there, but, you know, he played well. He definitely understood the game, you know, then comes out high school tryouts and, and, and he didn't make the team and, you know, his hopes were shattered for a while. And, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to speak for him, but, you know, uh, as, as you know, and 
um, you know, he recently uh, committed to a junior college that he's, you know, very excited about. Um, and I think that, you know, having, having that ability to know that, okay, yeah, I, like you said, you know, I, I may suck right now, but that's okay. Cause I can just take it into my own hands and do something about it. And uh, that's a skill that will apply no matter what in life, whether, you know, he continues beyond junior college and four or four year school or professional, but, you know, as a young man, knowing that failures happen, sometimes you don't get the opportunity. Sometimes you come across someone who for whatever reason, you know, doesn't see in you what you see in you, you got to bet on yourself and you got to give yourself every opportunity um, to take advantage of your dreams because they're your dreams and, and, and there's no room for anyone else to squash them. I love it. I love it. And I just invited him to speak as well too. So uh, if you wanted to go ahead and, and speak Sammy a little bit about your journey for yourself and uh, just be able to, you know, talk about some of your experiences and how hope has played into your process as well too. We'd, we'd really enjoy hearing your journey. Can you see me all right? I'm in the car, so. Am I good? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So, like my dad said, uh, all through middle school, I really wanted to play for the high school team, really wanted to do it. And then I show up after trials are done, and I don't make it. And I'm like, I'm destroyed. That's the one thing I wanted to do in high school. The one thing, like, I, I knew I was good enough to, to, act, to be able to do it, and I didn't understand why. And after that, there was about an hour where I was just like, okay, I don't care. I'm going to do whatever I can to go play at the next level or come back next year and then get make the team. So I put my head down. I worked out very hard. I got very strong. Um, I grew a lot. Uh, so I, I was getting stronger. I was getting bigger, I was getting, I was hitting harder, I was throwing faster, and then this summer, I went out and I throw 85, and I start getting uh, calls from Coach Pick at uh, Mid-Michigan, and this, two weeks ago, I committed there because it's a great program, and I know that he's going to allow me to do things that I'm not, I wasn't able to do in high school, which is, I'm going to have that. Um, environment to go and have fun and still be able to have still be able to do the things that I would have been able to do in high school in college now so it was a big thing of hope for me that I was hopeful that I was able to still play the game of baseball because I love baseball I, I want to be around baseball for my whole entire life and thankfully I will be I, I will be able to go at least another two years hopefully more but the hope was big for me through that time I appreciate you taking a, a couple of minutes and, and jumping on the call and sharing that information with us big time. I mean, and we're not all going to have the same journeys, but we can definitely learn from each other's journeys. Absolutely. Because um, I, I wanted to invite anybody that wants an opportunity to maybe uh, share a little bit of their their hopeful journey or anything that they feel like can be impactful to anybody in any way to uh, to make a request to get on the mic and, and share a little bit of your journey, because I, I truly believe in these different things, guys, we're going to learn from each other more than we're going to learn from what, what any of us might have to be saying. But well, uh, while anybody else goes through thinking about any aspect of contributing, you know, I could tell you briefly for myself, why uh why hope for me is just personally so so important um i had to have a, a tremendous amount of hope as i decided like i was saying briefly to go back and play junior college baseball at, at 30 years old and as crazy as that was it was really the reasoning for for why i'm here today because i have an opportunity now to to have said that you know if i could do it you can do it because there's absolutely no reason that I should have been able to accomplish what I did, but I was given opportunities by people that, you know, maybe they weren't even real opportunities. I think that maybe my coach, my junior college coaches didn't even know how to tell a 30 year old guy that maybe you shouldn't be trying out for the team. But I had a belief in myself of, of a change that I needed to make. 
And, and it really wasn't until I had my son that I knew that I needed to make a change. Cause if I was going to ever ask that young man to do anything, I needed to try to do it right myself. So, you know, my hope for my future of what I believed that I could become as, as a person was way more important than the process of making a team of getting a scholarship of becoming a coach and, and working through that whole process. It it's, the reasoning of my why was because I, I had my family that I needed to make sure was growing in the direction that I was proud of and that they would be proud of me. And in that process, I've truly found myself as a person of where I know the value that I can help these different young men try to avoid some of the same brick walls that I drove myself right into. And then the reality is, is it still might not work. They're going to still make those mistakes, but I hope to be a positive influence to those people when they make those mistakes to keep going through that process and not run from the mistakes like I did myself. So I know we got um, Chris and Denise Egg that had jumped in as well too. So if you guys want to go ahead and take it, feel free. Yeah, hopefully everyone's doing well and I truly appreciate everybody who's on this and Walter and Brian for everything you're doing. Um, like Walter was saying, it's just uh, back in the day, it was kids go out and play, no structure. They figure it out for themselves. And you're learning through the world of going through clinics and everything from all levels. It's about training, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And if you think about training at the basic level with tees and front flips and everything, everything seems to be so organized and protective and it's, do you feel good in this moment? Well, let's start challenging kids to get outside of their comfort zone so they can handle those setbacks. And the game of baseball, it's not about everything being perfect. It's about what you do to make a, adjustments and adapt just like in life. And so not that's just the physical, but more the mental is every day, what you put in your mind is what's going to come out of your mind and your body. So the importance of every single day, instead of your first routine being to go brush your teeth or take a shower, what are you doing daily mentally as a routine to put positive thoughts in your head? When you look in the mirror, what do you see and what are you saying to it? So I just kind of wanted to add the importance of understanding there's going to be failures. That's life. Train to accept that, the physical and the mental of it, and, and and know that you can do that. Don't just, it's always good to be positive, but mentally put yourself, see yourself going through the tough times and then see yourself working yourself out of it. So I don't know. I didn't have anything kind of pre-planned to say. I was just kind of flying off the hip. So. No, that's great, Chris. Really appreciate it. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, we can. Yes, we can. I feel like the Verizon guy now, right? <clears throat> um. Just want to put one thing out there. Well, first, hope is hold on, pain ends. H O P E. Hold on, pain ends. And sometimes that pain is not caused by your failure at all. Um, when I was four years old, I went and saw the Blue Angels fly. My mother told me for years that that's all I ever wanted to be and that's all I ever wanted to do. And I went through high school, graduated near the top of my class, got accepted to a world-renowned engineering school, got through that. <clears throat> and in my senior year, went and took my flight exams, all my tests to get into AOCS. Um, my recruiter, who had been there for seven years, she said, she had never seen test scores like mine on all four tests. I scored 100%, didn't miss a single question, nothing. I had an SR-71 colonel as a recommendation letter. Again, I had an engineering degree from one of the world's foremost engineering schools. We submitted my application, came back a no. I did everything perfect. I did everything that was expected of me and beyond. And it still came back, no. Um, everybody was shocked. 
including myself. And again, sometimes the hope that drives our dreams may not be failed upon by yourself because there are interactions across our lives that no matter what we want, no matter what we dream for, no matter what our hope drives us to do, sometimes we don't have the power to actually make that final choice as to whether or not we're gonna get to where we really ultimately wanna be. So what did I do? Yeah, my hope was to still fly. So six months later, I, I, <laughs> I went back to college, worked on another degree, and six months later, they said, yep, we can resubmit. And I resubmitted. Came back no again. Um, we all weren't sure why, because it was basically a perfect package. So they said, now I have to wait a year. So I finished out some more schooling. And the third and final time, because you can't submit it more than three times, and I had to retake all my tests, pass them with perfect scores again, resubmitted everything. In fact, I got a senator's, a, a senator's recommendation along with the, the colonel's recommendation. And I finally got accepted. So just to put that out there, that some of the, some of the things that people think of as hope is that <clears throat> I have to hope because of my failure. And that's true for a lot of life, but it's also not true for a lot of life that I want this job, boy, I hope I get this job. And that job doesn't come through. It just happened to my daughter a month ago, this last month. She was looking for a specific job and she got turned down on it. And she got hired by somebody else for actually more money three weeks later. <laughs> so, um, so sometimes, you know, the, the path that we take we have to keep taking it, whether or not it's our failure that keeps us from achieving that hope and that dream, or it's somebody else that is 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 a roadblock for that as well. And I'll end with that. That was profound and uh, and an awesome testament of of adversity, but ultimately as well too of your own personal beliefs of what you sought at for yourself and you'd done everything that you could, like you said, and and still didn't get the answers. And I think that a lot that gets so relevant to sports because you might be doing everything that you think is right in the process, but the results just aren't coming yet. But just like you said, hold on, pain ends. So keep working at everything that you're doing for yourself. And I know we're approaching the nine o'clock hour for ourselves. And I want to give Brian and, and Walter a chance to say anything else for themselves before we, uh, get towards wrapping up. I got an actionable recommendation for you guys to be able to get some work in. Uh, if you want, had a pen and paper handy after they speak, and then I'll hit us with a little bit of a closing. I was going to let Walter wrap it up. I, I know he's going to, he's going to bring us all home. That's a lot of pressure there, Brian. Um, I'm simply going to end with this purpose. What is, what is your purpose? What is our purpose? That's a really powerful word. And oftentimes parents try to funnel their purpose down to sometimes inadvertently, but down to, to, their, to their children. And one of the greatest lessons that I learned as a father was that my purpose was much, much different. Not due to age, not due to experience, but mainly due to the fact that I was going to have several decades as an adult to come to terms, to make changes, to move forward. But when you are a young student, not just student athlete, the weight and expectations that the world puts into 
our children's lives at such a very, very young age. Their purpose should be to be as, with a daily structure and routine, to be the best student that they're capable of being, best son or daughter that they're capable of being, um, do the best in and out of the classroom, on and off the field of sport, on and off, whether they're in the band, taking piano lessons, etc. Their purpose is much, much different. And they have one singular decade to live in those moments. And so as a father, when I'm speaking with parents, the number one thing that I try to explain to them from the perspective of a coach is as a coach, my purpose was never to be, be all about baseball. I can remember speaking to my college team September of 2011 in trying to get them to understand the horrific events and how it would shape their futures and for them to have a purpose from that day forward of being kinder, not being judgmental, but being curious. And if we as coaches and if we as adults, if we as mentors can simply remind ourselves to not judge, but to be curious, to not talk as much and to listen more and to convey that, that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay not to understand. It's okay to not be at the same speed as, as other peers around them, that everything that they do in life will be on their time and in their environment. And it's okay to make changes on a day-to-day -day basis. And that, to me, is a purpose. And as a father and as a coach, I've missed many an opportunity. And so now I find myself, when people ask, what's in it for you and why? I tell a story of a college student-athlete that played a collective total of 30 innings in four years for me. And we had a 10-year reunion, and he showed up. Uh, and now he's a successful entrepreneur. Uh, he only has two children. And when I asked him to kind of tell me or tell the, the group that had assembled what he took away from college, what he took away from being a college student athlete with our, within our program. He turned to probably 50 former student athletes and coaches. And he said, I learned that it wasn't about the number of opportunities, but, but more importantly, being accountable and present when the opportunity took place. And that was powerful. That was purpose. And if nothing else, you know, anything that I've said tonight, I really want parents and student athletes to think back. That wasn't a young man that played every inning of every game. That wasn't a young man that could say he was a captain of the team. In fact, he was a, I wouldn't say he was an integral part of any one of the four years. But when he spoke, that was a very, very powerful moment as a former student athlete. And I got a chance to look back. And I think that that's a great takeaway for parents to take away tonight. Walter, that was fantastic. And it definitely a perfect, perfect last speaker to be able to wrap up tonight. And, and I, just being able to tie purpose in there is so fantastic. And uh, so I, I want to just give everybody a real quick actionable uh, thing that I like to try to recommend every week. And this one comes from, from Tony Robbins. So if you, it's, it's just a little bit of uh, some goal setting aspect, but really want to encourage everybody to write a personal mission statement for yourself. Get started with that. And uh, number one, I want you to select an area of life of your own life that you'd like to improve and describe what that area is like for you currently. 
You got to be specific. Number two, I want you to write down the rituals that have shaped your current conditions in this area. Be honest. And number three, write down what you want. What's your compelling vision? Again, you got to be specific. And number four, write down the rituals that will get you your compelling vision. What would you need to do differently each day to get what you want? So try to take some action for yourself, uh, being intentional with what we have going on. And with that, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a, of a wrap up, but I just want to thank you all that have been here on the call. You know, thank you to our guests and the abundance of quality information that they've been able to share with all of us. We're stronger together. We grow faster and more with a willingness to take in information just like this. But remember, we got to put the plans we have into action for there to be any real results. Do not sit on the sideline and watch your future go by. Get in there and make it come to life. I'll leave you with a great quote from Barbara Kingslover. The very least you can do in your life is figure out what you hope for. And the most you can do is live inside that hope. Not admire it from a distance, but live right in it, under its root. Appreciate everybody being on the call. I hope everybody has a great night. And, and again, thank you to our guests and thank you for everybody being here.